Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last lecture of uh, the ACT lecture series, which is um, at this time uh, entitled Cinematic Migrations. And um, it's been an, uh, a very interesting uh, several weeks of presentations. It's been uh, very informative uh, having the various guests who've come uh, to this uh, project, really, uh, Cinematic Migrations uh, is a kind of umbrella, a sort of porous umbrella that's being used to gather a number of different um, positions in relation to the notion of uh, the moving image, what cinema could be imagined and what it's becoming. Uh, and uh, tonight we have Krista Lyons uh, as our guest who will be uh, giving us some other indications that I'm very curious about. Um, Krista is an assistant professor uh, and uh, recently a Canada Research Chair uh, in Feminist Media Studies uh, in the Communication Studies Department at Concordia University in Montreal in Canada. And um, she she hails, in terms of her PhD, from uh, Santa Cruz's History of Consciousness uh, program. Uh, and her work has been included in uh, various journals, including Signs and Third Text, uh, as well as an anthology um, entitled Space Resolutions, Intervention and in Research in Visual Culture. That's from 2011. She has a book uh, that will be released in January, uh, and it is called Prismatic, Prismatic Media, Transnational Circuits, Feminism in a Globalized Present, uh, and um, yeah, uh, please look for that. We're already reading a part of it uh, for our seminar. And uh, tonight's talk uh, is entitled Creative Geographies, Video Beyond the Global Village. Uh, and in it, um, Professor Lyons extends Frederick Jameson's insights to questions of representation and cultural production in the context of current crises and failures of market structures in the 21st century, as well as the speculative, generative coincidences between protest movements around the globe, focusing specifically on artworks that just juxtapose chronometric in cinematic time. In his critical analysis of postmodern culture, Jameson asserts that the particular temporality of video, its, quote, total flow, uh, binds apparatus and subject in a new kind of materialism governed by measurement, a machinic time closer to the chronometer than the cinema. The product is a kaleidoscopic image of distinct streams whose historicism is revealed by the organization of videographic space and time. So um, I'm very curious uh, to hear um, what's going to be developed. And uh, welcome, Krista Lines. <laughs> Thank you, Renee, for this really incredible invitation. I've been following the uh, cinematic migration announcements and wishing that I were in Boston <laughs> for all of the other ones so I could actually hear what other people had to say. It, was, it sounds like it's been a, a really uh, compelling and interesting uh, set of papers and set of discussions, and I'm really looking forward to, to meeting with the students as well tomorrow and, and continuing our discussions. I also wanted to thank Laura for uh, all of her tremendous organizational efforts in getting me here and getting all my <laughs> papers in order and, and, uh, and making this happen. It was, it was very, uh, very helpful, and she was very, very um, indispensable to, to bringing me here. The title of, of my talk is The Time of the Machine, Formalist Strategies in the Era of New Media. The Arab Spring, the Indignados Movement, Occupy Wall Street, and the proliferation of occupations that have enlivened critical and aesthetic discourses around social movements. The almost worldwide eruption of protests has seemed to confirm the vision of a veritable multitude, a global revolutionary movement allied with the powerful proximity of symbols and actions 
made available by new media? What role might socially engaged art play in visualizing political action, in creating iconic images which migrate across specific cultural contexts? The mobility of the term occupy, despite critical attempts to historicize occupation in the US context, is frequently metaphorical. Oh, sorry, no. <laughs> the mobility of the term occupy draws its power from the tactic of gaining ground, even as the territory conquered is frequently metaphorical. The term occupy Sandy, for instance, emphasizes the symbolic resonance of the term occupy, even in instances of territorial occupation, such as at Zuccotti Park. The slogan of liberation in the image on the right that you see over here um, similarly serves a universalizing logic by which specific instances of social revolt might be tied to a deterritorialized political praxis. The icons of these movements do not merely impress the same stamp everywhere as icons tend towards in their globalizing travels, but create chains of signification whose associative links frequently remain obscure. The metonymic slide of the term occupy is also echoed in the self-conscious metamorphosis of the printemps arabe, the Arab Spring, into the printemps érable, the Maple Spring, by the student strike in Quebec several months ago. The students themselves admitted that the political conditions of their uprising could not be compared to the conditions in Tunisia or Egypt, but used the near homonym as to galvanize the student movement and tie the specific demands of students to a broader environmental and social justice agenda. The mobility of images, particularly through social media, but also in the circulation of narrative films and experimental videos through exhibitions, festivals, and cinemas, frequently reanimate the fantasy of the, go the global village figured by Marshall McLuhan in the mid-20th century. The vision of new media as constituting a new, quote, extension of man in McLuhan's terms is allied in many respects to the conceptual category of a new revolutionary class, atomized but joined by their structural position in the international division of labor. The twin visions of the global village and the multitude produce a new universal rhetoric, unifying local acts of resistance and specific instances of socially engaged art in anti-global, frequently anti-capitalist, and at times anti-imperialist social movements. These globalized instances draw from, but also at times impoverish, the revolutionary imaginaries of socialism, national liberation, and anti-imperialism in the 20th century. But how might coalitional politics be conceived beyond the lining up of parallel social movements, movements which are tied together by pr traditional universal ideals such as justice, or freedom, beyond also the circulatory metaphors of global capitalism itself, with their emphasis on incorporation. How do media mediate beyond the tropes of visual, visual immediacy, technological extension, viral spread, or broadcast dissemination? How might we trace other theories for the globalizing dimensions of media beyond the global village? And to what extent does contemporary film and video draw aesthetically both from the globalizing dimensions of this cultural conjuncture, but also from historical aesthetic and political formal strategies? The consensus remains that our conjuncture is marked as a problematic of globalization. Attempts to understand the cultural landscape are governed by a concern with transnational or global dimensions of media, which has critical advantages. The scale of the global poses the challenge of political economy in very real and very immediate ways. And it forces us to think creative practices beyond local and national frameworks in the light of the complexities of contemporary relational geographies of power. Too frequently, however, media practice is simply reduced to the conceptual categories of globalized late capitalism or of neoliberalism. In such frameworks, space itself is continuously refigured as either a passive void or a zone of exchange. I'm grateful for Renee Green's invitation to participate in this provocative series on cinematic migrations and for the compelling set of questions that the notion of cinematic migration poses to the expanded field of global film and video. For if the space of the global is constituted as a zone of exchange, this implies also that it's constituted through the very real processes of interaction, travel, 
and translation that produces not only the expansion of certain tropes and forms across the globe, but also the existence of what Brent Edwards terms décalage, a gap both spatial and temporal which signifies the heterogeneity and multiplicity of cinematic processes across incommensurable social and cultural spaces. This necessary corrective is not meant to simply obscure the poignancy of the global village in its material dimensions, as well as as a powerful fantasy of interconnection. McLuhan's early diagnosis of the extensions of the human through communications technology in many respects carefully describes the continued force of globalized media in the contemporary moments and the voraciousness of capital which serves as a propulsive force both for the infrastructures and circuits through which cinematic forms migrate as well as for icons with translative potential. McLuhan saw the information economy as a mechanism for extending consciousness beyond a single time and place. He stated, I'm gonna read a, a long quote from him, video related technologies are the critical instrument of such change. The new telecommunication multi-carrier corporation dedicated solely to moving all kinds of data at the speed of light will continually generate tailor-made products and services for individual consumers. Users will simultaneously become producers and consumers. Culture becomes organized like an electric circuit. Each point in the net is as central as the next. Electronic man loses touch with the concept of a ruling center, as well as the restraints of social rules based on interconnection. Hierarchies constantly dissolve and reform. Nam Jun Paik's global groove exemplifies this belief in the utopic possibilities of mass communication, promising a glimpse of a video landscape of tomorrow. This is a quote from him, right? A glimpse of a video landscape of tomorrow when you'll be able to switch on any TV station on earth and TV guides will be as fat as the Manhattan telephone book and in which cultural practices from around the world would be brought together in the seamless and distributed electronic space of broadcast television. At the same time, McLuhan foresaw that the processes of interconnection and decentralization were not irreversible nor exhaustive. He was sensitive both to the agglutinations that produce in his terms new tribalisms, as well as the constant processes of enhancement, obsolescence, retrieval and reversal, which he called the tetrad. The liberatory aspects of the global village for McLuhan lay particularly in the vacillation of what he called visual and acoustic space of figure and ground, which extended beyond hierarchical systems of power toward lateral networks across space. He called this vacillation a resonating interval, produced in his example by the images humans saw of the Earth taken by the Apollo astronauts in 1968, and in the experience of simultaneously being on Earth and on the moon of being effectively in the airless void between. As an aside, we might imagine how this resonating interval might also describe the airless void between the different instantiations of Occupy around the world. We might also be tempted, and I'm gonna come back to this at the end of the paper, even though it's not, it's not quite fleshed out as I would like it to be, to contrast this resonating interval with Trin Min Ha's reflexive interval, where, and this is a quote from her, a positioning within constantly incurs the risk of depositioning, and where the work, never freed from historical and sociopolitical context, nor entirely subjected to them, can only be itself by constantly risking being nothing. McLuhan's resonating interval involves a chiasmic vacillation. Technologies come into view, recede into obsolescence, are retrieved as melancholic objects and reverse back into ground. But for McLuhan, and this is another quote from him, the new video related technologies promise to impose a new monopoly of ground over figure. Whatever is left of mechanical age values could be swallowed up by information overload. His understanding that in the global village, ground or space as a monopoly over figure echoes the focus on space and spatial logics over temporal organization under postmodernism. Frederick Jameson has argued that the problem with the valorization of spatial logics under postmodernism 
is that absent the ability to organize past and future into a coherent experience, cultural production becomes simply, in his terms, a heap of fragments. Rather than stress the discontinuous and heterogeneous status of cultural production under globalization, he wishes to stress what he calls the proper tension in the term relationship to the notion of difference itself. Video becomes Jameson's paradigmatic example because in his view, it constitutes, quote, the supreme and privileged symptomatic index of the zeitgeist, the richest allegorical and hermeneutic vehicle for some new description of the system itself. It's the particular temporality of video, its total flow, which resists narrative closure and binds apparatus and subject in a new kind of materialism governed by a time subject to measurement, a machinic time closer to the chronometer than the cinema. Jameson's understanding of video's temporality in the waning years of the 20th century, rather than emphasizing the electronic effacement of the referent in the culture of late capitalism, highlights the manner in which the non-narrative structure of experimental video and concomitantly the increasing non-narrative structure of mass media itself exposes and articulates processes of rationalization and reification, what he calls a particular seam between time and space. The spatial and temporal dynamics of time-based media under late capitalism were not principally about the erosion of indexicality, but rather about the imbrication of imaging technologies in the processes of production, and thus point to the syncopation of film and video with what he terms machinic time. Whereas in the first industrial machine age, the excitement of machinery was symbolized by the exhilaration of futurism, and thus by, works, uh, um, and thus by the works of Marinetti, Le Corbusier, Picabia, and Duchamp, late capitalism doesn't possess the same capacity for representation. Contemporary culture in the global system, in Jameson's view, produces a kaleidoscopic image of distinct streams of elements whose historicism, whose relation to historical time and thus also to historical fissures are revealed by the very organization of videographic space and time. These kaleidoscopic visions offer a shorthand, he says, for grasping, and this is a quote again, a network of power and control even more difficult for our minds and imaginations to grasp, the whole new decentered global network of the third stage of capital itself. Jameson's example is, of course, famously the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles, but I'd like to pursue his conclusions in the domain of time-based media in the contemporary moment. The kaleidoscopic nature of time-based media stems partially from video's aesthetics of boredom, the provocation or calculated assault on the viewer produced by the absence of narrative, long shots, and repetitive action as well as the multiplicity of screens, shots, or streams. What such videographic experiments throw into conflict is our experience of the fictive temporality of time-based media, the foreshortening of reality in filmic montage, in exchange for what Jameson calls the ticking away of real time, minute by minute, the dread underlying the irrevocable reality of the meter running. The temporality of early video experiments, such as Jonas's vertical roll, which we see on the right, thus exposes a materialist subjective temporality of machinery and of matter. The experiential, the time of time-based media, is produced in the emergence of the machine. And the most striking example, of course, under modernity for this is E.P. Thompson's essay on the introduction of the chronometer into the workplace. While the nature of media's flow has undergone significant transformations in the light of new media platforms and processes, as well as the blurring of technologies and narrative conventions, Jameson's insights on the particular conjunctures of space and time mediated in culturally dominant and experimental forms are critical for coming to terms with the questions of mediation under the current climate of economic crisis and political protest. For while video's flow was, as we saw previously, joined to the spatial figurations of the global village, both the crises and failures of market structures in the 21st century 
and the still speculative but generative coincidences between forms of social protest around the globe signal different configurations of space and time that are less bound by the tropes of simultaneity and broadcasting than by concerted, politically engaged, signifying practices. Practices which very often juxtapose the chronometric reification of time with the structures of cinematic montage, for instance, or literary narrative genres. Rather than the global village, then how might we recognize in the current conjuncture the complexity of differential contexts of globalization, and specifically to see global processes as overlapping and competing geographies of locations with their different logics of boundaries, connectivities, and stratifications. The very scale of the global demands an imaginative leap across specific instances to understand and engage the effects of globalization in the interest of forging sites of solidarity and resistance. Such scales of analysis in media, in activism, and academics focus on questions of production and reception in cultures of exchange, attending specifically to the differential relationships in the global system and the uneven terms of cooperation, even as the aim remains to discover possibilities for alliances, alternative histories, or new identity positions. This approach is guided by the challenge the anthropologist Anna Tsing poses for scholars of freeing critical imaginations from the specter of neoliberal conquest, singular, universal, global. She argues, quote, the attention to the frictions of contingent articulations can help us describe the effectiveness and the fragility of emergent capitalist and globalist forms. This challenge refocuses our attention on the emergent forms of media practice, migratory aesthetic strategies, images and symbols, as well as on the distinct historical nature of cinematic and political strategies. If Jameson asserts that the very conditions of late capitalism and postmodernism produce a kaleidoscopic image of distinct elements, how might committed artistic strategies engage the complexities of time and space in the current conjuncture without conceding to a homogenous and continuous vision of the globe or of progress? I'd like to turn to a video work and performance by the Serbian artist Milika Tomic, which I hope to use to flesh out my argument in the second half of this paper. The work is entitled, One Day Instead of One Night, A Burst of Machine Gun Fire Will Flash If Light Cannot Come Otherwise. Uh, Oscar Davicio, Fragment of a Poem. In it, the artist records her passage through the places in Belgrade where successful actions were carried out by the People's Liberation Movement during World War II, carrying a machine gun in her hand. The soundtrack includes five interviews with partisans who participated in the liberation of what would become the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. In, the video begins with Tomic walking down a residential street in the direction of the camera. As she crosses the street to turn right, her continuous movement is severed by her appearance in a different section of Belgrade, passing in front of a small antique shop. As the video progresses, the path Tomic um, traces brings into view pedestrian crossings, train tracks, bus stations, busy commercial centers, and residential streets. The viewer quickly becomes aware that while Tomic's movement appears nominally continuous from scene to scene, the path she traces through the city of Belgrade is constituted out of a series of fragments stitched together to form an artificial landscape or creative geography. The formal aesthetic of one day draws not from the languages of telecommunications technology, as for example with Ursula Beeman or Lisa Autogena and Joshua Portnoy, nor from the immediate intimacy of social media in Cirrus Frisch, for example, or the Yes Men, but from the structuralist film theory of early 20th century Russian filmmaker Lev Kuleshov. Kuleshov posited that it was possible through cinematic montage to create a visual terrain that existed nowhere in reality. The capacity to, quote, synthesize a creative geography was certainly a formal cinematic device, but it also served several synthetic fantasies for Kuleshov himself the geopolitical suturing of the American White House with shots of a well-known building in Moscow, the synthesizing of a filmic female body by combining separate shots of several women's bodies 
cut, as Laura Mulvey would argue, to the measure of desire. And most famously, suturing the viewer to the actor, Mozhukin's effective responses through a shot counter shot sequence known as the Kuleshov effect. The theory of montage proposed by Kuleshov posited that the associational power of montage was in the viewer's consciousness and bore no necessary relation to objective reality. The aim of formalist cinema in the 1920s was to create new modes of aesthetic perception by derogating, dismantling, and reconstructing traditional art forms. The formalists and futurists of Russian cinema were engaged in developing a materialist analysis of art as a system of signs. The artistic text constituted a conjuncture of stylistic elements that constituted its cinematic quality, as well as a system of signs that expressed social values. The material and value-laden system of artistic discourse were taken to reside in structure. Language was thus viewed as concrete, materialist, mass-oriented, and was consistent with materialist interpretations of history. Kuleshov argued that in montage, three, four, or five storylines could exist in parallel, and yet in the film, they would be gathered together in one place. One day uses montage to make various sites in Belgrade, sites of historical acts of resistance and political struggle, appear to occur in a single location over a continuous period of time. Initially, such continuity seems to tend towards the resonating interval in which the distance between places is collapsed. But these aesthetic strategies are mobilized to pose questions about the temporal and spatial coincidence of revolutionary events and revolutionary aesthetic styles. The different locations are encountered several times in the video, with Tomic frequently moving to and fro in rhythmic patterns across the sites. The use of Kuleshov's montage technique foregrounds not the seamlessness of space mediated by technologies of representation, but the very act of synthesizing political actions and the dependence of such synthesis on the metaphors of a continuous landscape or ground from which actions spring. In narrowing the spatial gap between resistance actions, Tomic creates a landscape of revolt where action follows upon action. The defamiliarization of scenic juxtapositions, however, also defers the continuity of the landscape in the contemporary moment, a moment marked not by the unified actions of anti-fascist struggle, but by the unstable question of revolutionary action against the decentralized and largely virtualized power of global capitalism. We might recall the absence of ground in Namjoon Paik's global groove I showed earlier, the emphasis on a purely electronic space or airless void in which the dancing figures are suspended. Paik distorted the televisual medium with colorizing, video feedback, magnetic scan modulation, and nonlinear mixing to generate not only a properly videographic aesthetic style, but also a rendering of telecommunicative space on the model of the resonating interval described by McLuhan. One day, on the other hand, not only reproduces the realism of figure ground relations in the representational conventions of indexical media, it renders her action through a historically inflected cinematic space. The video thus reflects and reflects upon a historical moment in which the impression of reality is constructed through the realization of a coherent and positioned space, a space constituted, according to Stephen Heath, in movement, positioning, cohering, binding in a coding of relations of mobility and continuity. Pierre Francastel notes evocatively that, and this is a quote from Francastel, spaces are born and die like societies. They live, they have a history. In the 15th century, the human societies of Western Europe organized, in the material and intellectual senses of the term, a space completely different from that of preceding generations. With their technical superiority, they progressively imposed that space over the planet. Modern cinema had a synthetic function tied to the development of modernity itself and its spatial paradigms. It confirmed a monocular perspective and the positioning of the spectator subject in an identification with the camera at the point of a centrally embracing view. The movement of figures in a film, the camera's movement, and the movement from shot to shot both hold film within a certain vision, 
unfolding a vision of the world as and in space, and at the same time hold the possibility of radically disturbing that vision through dissociations in time and space that produce contradictions of the alignment of the camera eye in the human eye in order to displace the subject of the social historical individual into an operative transforming relation to reality. And that's a quote from Stephen Heath. Movement is central to cinematic language. From the outset, human figures figured movement in film by spilling out of the train or leaving the factory. Heath argues, quote, the figures move in the frame, they come and go, and there is then need to change the frame, reframing with the camera movement or moving to another shot. The transitions thus affected pose acutely the problem of the filmic construction of space, of achieving coherence of place, and positioning the spectator as the unified and unifying subject of its vision. It's only through trick effects, eyeline matching, or the 180 degree rule, for instance, that space is ever perceived as unitary. The spatialization of the events of resistance in Tomic's work may, on an initial reading, be viewed in relation to the spatial turn under postmodernism, the displacement of time, the spatialization of the temporal, registered by a sense of nostalgia in its apolitical form. The possibility of unification, of revolutionary consciousness voiced by the partisans who participated in both the anti-fascist resistance and the emerging communist movement would then be read as a nostalgia for nostalgia, a mourning of memory itself. What Jameson terms, quote, the sharp pang of the death of the modern, particularly for the possibility of an engaged and political art practice. But I believe that Tomic wants to argue against a simple nostalgia, a regressive postmodernism. Instead, she asserts the necessity of reinventing a utopian vision in contemporary politics. For Jameson, the 1960s forward constituted a renewal of utopian imagination, not coalescing in a political movement such as socialism, but producing a vital range of micro-political movements, which were, quote, properly spatial utopias in which the transformation of social relations and political institutions are projected onto the vision of place and landscape. He concludes that spatialization also provides the possibility for thinking the libidinal investment of the utopian, and at the least, the proto-political. The 1940s are not returned to simply with nostalgia for the revolutionary praxis of the period. Tomic foregrounds the specificity of the anti-fascist struggle to its historical moment through several devices, devices which draw out the metaphorical resonances of the weapons of revolutionary struggle. In the first instance, one interviewer stresses the need to develop strategies of resistance suited to the incursions of power themselves. He says, the fascist power, weapons, technology, tanks, we were no match for them. We had no arsenals, nor weapons, factories, no supplies. People gathered to fight barehanded, yes. Our weapons factories were German weapons factories. We took it from them and beat them with their own weapons. In the second instance, Tomic herself stages her action carrying an AK-47 assault rifle first developed in the Soviet Republic by Mikhail Kalashnikov in the last year of World War II. As we saw in the video, the rifle isn't raised at all throughout the action. Passerbys ignore Tomic's weapon, and she carries it with the same nonchalance with which she carries a plastic bag in her other hand. And yet the weapon is historically specific, raised as a question, raised as the question of political action in the contemporary moment. What weapon might serve the purposes of liberatory struggles now? And how might the grounds of political action be figured through what aesthetic and technological mediations? The exposure of the creative geography in Tomic's work is meant to exacerbate the tension between fragmentation, the dispersal of the video into separate screens that do not match up, and unification, the positing of a properly cinematic narrative space. In citing Kuleshov's montage aesthetic, Tomic allies her performative intervention not with the airless void of much new media work, but rather with the mystification that transforms the fragments of shots that make up a film into the narrative coherence of cinematic space. The constitution of space in the contemporary moment and the flattening of historical frameworks and the simultaneity of global flows is thus only constituted through a synthetic action 
one which discounts the discontinuities within globalizing processes. In cinematic spaces, quote, frames hit the screen in succession, figures pass across the screen through the frames, the camera tracks, pans, reframes, shots replace and according to the rules continue one another. Film is the production not just of a negation, but equally, simultaneously, of a negativity, the excessive foundation of the process itself, of the very movement of the spectator as subject in the film. One day also allies the development of revolutionary aesthetic languages with the development of revolutionary political praxis of the early 20th century. The testimonies of the partisans of the People's Liberation Movement are like the scenes and actions stitched together out of numerous interviews to allegorize an account of political struggle and emancipatory politics in the anti-fascist struggles of the 1940s. Taken together, the interviewer's statements give a singular but multivocal account of the development of political consciousness on the one hand and a political movement on the other. The voiceover begins with a statement, if I were born again, I would follow the same path. Tomich's movement through the film is from the outset allegorized by the narrative of the partisans, by the choice to take part in resistance, to take the path of revolutionary action. Tomek's choice to begin and end the voiceover with the same statement also figures the narrative logic of return that synthesizes the testimonies and Tomic's intervention in a meaningful inquiry into modes of political action. Further, the interviewers emphasize the work of collaboration, of synthesizing a social movement out of the resistance to occupation. Quote, there was a strong popular resistance to occupation. The Communist Party read this perfectly. It sensed that people were ready to fight against the occupation for a better life. We did not introduce the Republic then, nor excluded the monarchy. There were royalists among the partisans. There were Christians, Muslims, believers, non-believers, but they were all anti-fascist. That was the key. People realized that they were only joining the struggle against evil. Partisans and partisan units came into being, not as a communist party army, nor as any party's army, but as an army of the people. The montage technique in the video thus serves not only to figure a creative geography of resistance, but to figure that landscape in the service of the work of building political solidarity. The move is not simply nostalgic, not the mourning of a taken for granted universalism, but the articulation of what anthropologist Anat Singh calls universal aspiration. On what grounds, through what forms of solidarity and mediation might social movements conceptualize the global even as a fiction or an imaginative act outside the global village. Drawing from Gayatri Spivak's compelling statement that, quote, we cannot not want the universal, even as it so often excludes us, Tsing argues for the theorization of global connection through what she calls generalization from small details, a generalization that involves first a unification of the field of inquiry through spiritual, aesthetic, mathematical, logical, or moral principles. And second, collaboration among different knowledge seekers to turn disparate forms of knowledge into compatible ones. Such collaboration involves the patient, provisional work of bridging and negotiating across incompatible differences. The key point Singh makes, however, is that both features of generalization, both unification and collaboration, mask one another. Quote, the specificity of collaboration is erased by pre-established unity. The a priori status of unity is denied by turning to its instantiation in collaborations. It is in fact the very interplay of universalization and negotiation that constitute and figure the global scale in its complexity. Rather than resolving this tension, Tsing uses the term friction to describe the unstable, unequal, and creative forms of interconnection across difference. She notes, quote, friction reminds us that heterogeneous and unequal encounters can lead to new arrangements of culture and power. Her method, ground the work of universalizing in specific historical contexts through the unstable and shifting arrangements of power knowledge in the global system. Likewise, frame the work of negotiation and collaboration in the aspirational and unfulfilled imaginary of a perpetually unachieved universalism. 
The work of encounters across difference in the world thus become a model for critical and cultural production, the careful theorization of discrepant conjunctures rather than a single-minded cultural explanation. The title of Tomich's work signals this work of difference and deferral, of negotiation in the service of an aspirational discourse whose constancy cannot be assumed in advance. The title is a fragment of a poem by the Serbian surrealist writer and revolutionary socialist activist, Oscar Davicho. Davicho's prose style was developed during and after the Second World War as an articulation of the revolutionary movement in Belgrade. The fragment itself is a promise to the future, one day, a commitment to action, to enlightenment through a call to arms in only the most desperate of times when light will not come otherwise. Tomich's performance and video work, however, are not simply committed to the deferral of revolutionary action to an imagined future. The sources that Tomich cites are chosen specifically because of their engagement with the history of political struggle in Belgrade and the multiple scale shifts by which revolutionary action is spatialized in the city, the nation, and the globe. The work is also dedicated to the members of the anarcho-syndicalist initiative and contains a specific notation, Belgrade, 3rd September, 2009. In doing this, Tomic joins a return to the sites of historical struggle to the complex multiplicity of social movements in the contemporary moment. The Greek riots in December 2008, sparked by the police shooting of a 15-year-old student. The so-called Belgrade Six activists, accused of inciting, assisting in, and executing an attack on the Greek embassy in Belgrade in 2009 in solidarity with Greek protesters and by extension, the joining of movements for social and economic justice through acts of solidarity around the world. The image on the bottom right is actually a protest in solidarity of the Belgrade Six in front of the Leeds Art Gallery in the UK. While classical cinema relies on the suspension of disbelief that grants the spectator an omnipotence of vision, Tomich's continuous and repetitive cutting up of space, on the other hand, both refuses narrative coherence and enacts a repetitive and circulatory motion that returns us to the distinction I made earlier between cinematic and chronometric time. If you remember, Jameson argues that kaleidoscopic visions in time-based media thus visualize and allow us to grasp the decentered global networks and their differential work in the global system. Tomich says about this work, quote, my character remains imprisoned in the editing loop of the actual video unable to find a way out for this newly created old territory. The aesthetic strategies of one day are bound to the specificity of contemporary Belgrade and to the historical, aesthetic, and material aspects of socially engaged art practice in post-Soviet republics. The commitments of the piece enact a de-virtualization of social relations and of the mediations of technology. In so doing, works such as hers highlight not only the real material relations that subtend the fantasy of the global village, but also the productive reanimation of other aesthetic forms in the interests of rupturing the machines of our times. Tomich's piece is therefore not a representation of the interconnectedness across social contexts brought upon by new communications technology, not a celebration of protest in the global village but a mediatic question posed about the role of scale making itself to representation, to understanding global and local imaginaries. Her performative act is an act of conjuring, not in the surface of counterposing the local against the abstract force of globalization, but of the specificity of universal aspirations in actions, icons, and aesthetic forms. Tomich thus evokes the history of anti-fascist resistance in and for contemporary globalized movements. The footage included in One Day focuses on the precise location of historical events, but Tomich's action presents instead the abstraction of an empty stage, a place of the event, a bounded space in which something may happen and before which one waits in formal expectation. That's again Jameson. As nothing actually happens in the footage, the place becomes degraded back into space. The quote, reified space of the modern city, quantified and measurable, in which land and earth are parceled out as so many commodities and lots for sale. This is foregrounded in Tomich's crossing back and forth in front of a shopping mall, 
formerly the site of the first act of sabotage on the part of the People's Liberation Movement, setting fire to a cistern in the yard of the Ford garage on Grubjanska, uh, Grubjanska Street. In the voiceover narratives, by contrast, we have a series of unvisualized events, the events of resistance, a successful attacks. Beyond the mediating framework of testimony and visual display, in fact, the referent itself is disclosed, the fact of resistance across the frames of reference, not encapsulated by them, with no originary event. The problem of reference is located in and through the medium itself and its synthesizing work, stripped of the utopian aspirations of the former period. The structural logic of the tape itself is in the process of production rather than its content, about the question of reproductive technology itself and reanimating political action. The images of bridges, train tracks, and bus stations foreground the colliding forms of globalizing processes, and thus also of mediatic strategies, which visualize the frictional force of time-based media rather than its resonating interval. Tomic herself has reflected on her use of Kulishov's editing technique, quote, this territory, even though it's made up of emancipatory politics, decisions, and actions, is imprisoned and occupied by a new time, the era of permanent war. Therefore, a new politics is not to be found yet, and that is why my character, even though she knows precisely where she's going, still wanders and roams, remaining imprisoned within a framework given long ago. But this character, even though she waits and wanders, knows what she's looking for, on the basis of previous experience, a new universalistic politics, outside organizations, movements, and groups, solitary, singular, but international. Tomic locates the public intervention and video work in the context of permanent war and discourses of terrorism in the 21st century. Resistance itself is recoded as terrorism, and acts of violence are justified by languages of security and anti-terrorism. For Tomic, the resistance of the partisan movement would be read today as acts of terror, even as their actions were anti-fascist and revolutionary, acts of war against war. This recoding is foregrounded by Tomic's frenzied return time and again to the railway bridge on Cardodeva Street, no longer crossing it to and fro, backwards and forwards in the time of historical memory, but approaching it from above and below, crisscrossing the site in a frenetic questioning pattern. This site, now covered in graffiti, and out of the way space if there ever was one, foregrounded in and by postmodern culture, is actually the site where an action was prevented. A teacher from Belgrade, Miladin Zaric, lived in the vicinity of the bridge and noticed that German soldiers were transporting packages of explosives to the bridge. Zaric had been an army officer and had participated in the liberation wars in 1912. He used a spade to cut the conductors to detonate the explosives and thus prevented the Germans from blowing up the bridge in 1944 as they were retreating. Tomic's return to this site figures the capture of one narrative by another, the rewriting of one form of narrative in terms of a different one, and what Jameson calls the ceaseless narrativization of already existing narrative elements by each other. The incommensurability of different struggles, and thus the specificity of the aesthetic and representational strategies mobilized in media work are themselves generative of theorizing in the globalized present. Rather than attempting to fill the gaps in our knowledge and practice, then, these gaps themselves might shed light on the differential position of subjects in the global system and the uneven character of cross-cultural exchange. Such an approach entails a complex understanding of the material, cultural, and political conditions of global contact and of the discrepancies that continue to make contact impossible. The work might be to make manifest these discrepancies as theoretical, cultural, and political objects. The critical ground of such an analysis lies not in exposing a common underlying structure in each case, and thus identifying a form of mimesis and aesthetic strategies or political actions, but in examining a generalized category across incommensurable social, culture, and political spaces. It also involves a careful parsing of the material connections and discrepancies to illuminate the historical and cultural differences between media activism, even as one might envision and enact common political and cultural projects across these differences. In conclusion, I'd like to return to Trinh Minha's notion of the reflexive interval. 
and the crucial differences her critical work raises to McLuhan's notion of the resonating interval. The reflexive interval for Trin emphasizes both the tenuousness of the centering of the subject in representation and the binding of the subject's location through historical and social specificity. She argues that, quote, reflexivity is not a mere question of rectifying, of justifying, of, in other words, providing a corrective to the subjective visions of an intense relativism. The reflexive text points to a subject as a subject in process, displays its own formal properties or its constitution as a work, to, in her terms, quote, set in motion in its praxis the self-generating links between different forms of reflexivity. Media in their reflexive forms articulate social and economic conjunctures, examining how specific representational processes have material, social, and semiotic effects, interpolating different audiences and viewing positions, drawing from idiomatic and accented semiotic codes, and referring to social realities which require complex mediating frameworks. They constitute, in Teresa de Loretis's evocative term, imaging machines, signifying practices that articulate meaning to images, engage subjectivity in that process, and map social visions into subjectivity. The intersections of the chronometric and the cinematic in Tomich's work thus serve to articulate the political and aesthetic return to questions of resistance in the context of a globalized present, and to theorize the possibilities and potentialities of new media in this context, media under the sway of globalization, but not sheltered behind the walls of the global village. Thank you. Could we get light so that I can see <laughs> I can see you? <laughs> if anyone has a question, raise their hand and I'll bring you the microphone. Oh, thank you. Hello. <laughs> I feel like I was in the in the spotlight and I didn't get to see any of you. Hi. Hi. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was intrigued with the uh, thematization of nostalgia in Tomic's work and uh, in many ways, I agree with your analysis that it escapes the nostalgia. Mm -hmm. But in many, I did feel this piece to be very nostalgic. Um, specifically, if it's read against the, um, the historical and political context of Yugoslavia, that, or post-socialist Yugoslavia. And I don't know, when is the piece from, from what year? 2009. Uh, 2009, yeah. yeah. So, um, there is, um, I mean, at some point you quote uh, Anne Singh saying um, that we need to ground the universal message in specific historic context. And if we take that quote seriously and read this piece against the historic and political context, um, we need to uh, consider also, um, well, the total absence of commentary on Serbia's involvement in the wars of Yugoslavia, um, and also that kind of struggle and fighting um, is not commented here, but specifically referred to, to the Second World War. Um, also the figures that she chose to speak, and I was able to understand the language, yes. so <laughs> it was uh, nice for me to, you know, the kind of rhetoric that they used was very nostalgic. It was evoking these paroles of communist um, um, struggle. Uh, so there is this tone in, in the interviews as well mm -hmm. that is very nostalgic. Mm -hmm. um, the other problematic part that I found in this piece was the... Uh, it's a part, it's making this universalist message um, of, well, occupation, um, and uh, questioning role of, of, of violence, and uh, so that, that's all fine. Um, but the problem that I had with this was, um, well, this, again, insistence on the Second World War. Again, if we bring it back to the context of of post-socialist Serbia and the ignorance of the uh, Yugoslav wars, you have Amerikusturica doing kind of the same type of message, 
with the film uh, Life is uh, Beautiful, basically saying war is horrible and war is bad. And it's a message that we all can agree with. But it's distracting with its kind of relativism from the actual political reality that is very contested and where Serbia is having a um, well, very contested role. So maybe you can comment yeah, on that. No, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about, because she had another piece where um, she was asked to do a public intervention and she hung herself by a rope suspended in front of a place where a certain action had happened in the same period. And it was very shortly after the, 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 the wars and the ethnic cleansing, so-called ethnic cleansing campaigns. And so this return to that period in, in the immediate post-war period was an interesting, an interesting strategy for me that clearly there's something about this moment in the historical struggles or politicization of struggles in Serbia and in Belgrade that captivates her as a model or as a, a place of return that, that, that might serve as a model for the contemporary moment. And I think she, I think she does more work on the specificity of, of, of 96 in another piece called I Am Milika Tomic, right, where she, I, mean, people, I don't know if people are familiar, she, she stands in a, a white kind of smock or dress and she says, I am Milika Tomic, I am, and says a nationality, and she says it in these different, uh, in a, um, a number of different languages. And it t creates these sharp cuts as she's kind of rotating it looks like she's sort of rotating in the dark. And as she says more and more national identities, more and more cuts appear on her body. And so the, 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 the force of making a claim to national identity is experienced as a kind of violence on, on her own body, right? And she becomes this, this kind of projected catalyst for these claims to nationalism, these claims to identity that's clearly related to 19, 1996 and to the movement between national and ethnic identities and, um, and the kind of violences of absolutism, particularly on the terrain of women's bodies. So in that one, she's very specific about citing 1996 as a particular moment. I think here, because she dedicates it to uh, the, the Serbian protests and solidarity with the Greek embassy, I think she's trying to think about what do all of these revolutionary actions and forms of solidarity mean in the contemporary moment? And what might it take to transform these spontaneous actions of solidarity in different parts of the world into something more concerted, into something that, that looks like a movement or an action? And in returning to, to this moment, she's trying to excavate a particular form of historical memory for the contemporary moment in, um, in Belgrade. I think she's clearly moved by these testimonies, and you can see the ways in which they provide uh, a, a more cohesive narrative than the visuals here. And so I think there's this kind of contrast between these narratives that really speak to this coming to consciousness and this lack of regret and this transformation on a personal and political and national level, and then this kind of incessant looping, moving through space that doesn't actually amount to that. And that's where I see that kind of, it's not just nostalgic, that the, the testimonies themselves are and the, 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 the articulation of a narrative event is, but that, that in relationship to this performance and this action disrupts that, that narrative, disrupts that, um, that nostalgia. And, and I think also the part of, one of the things that, that Jameson sees as regressive under postmodernism is not simply nostalgia, but nostalgia for nostalgia, right? Nostalgia for a feeling of loss that was the feeling of modernity, the romanticization of the ruin, the, the, the angel of history, right? These are these tropes of modernity that he says, well, this, this mourning of the loss of a particular form of loss is a regressive form of postmodernism, right? And so what I'm saying here is that this is not only, it's, I was saying less that this is not nostalgic, but that this is not a nostalgia for nostalgia. This is not a repetition of the modernist trope of the loss of plenitude, right? Because of all of the work that she does to say, synthesizing and suturing and creating something that looks holistic is done out of all of these fissures and fragments and 
different constituted elements and that maybe, maybe that unity is not an originary unity at all. Uh, and maybe I'm not nostalgic mm -hmm. about the loss of an originary unity as one would be if one were, lose, were mourning a, uh, a sense of loss, right, at that, at that, at that other remove. Um, but I think I take, I take your point about her nostalgia for the 1940s as a moment of revolutionary action for the present. I think, I think, um, I think yeah. she's mining it as a possibility for coming to consciousness. Yeah. yeah. No, because on the more theoretical uh, level, the work has um, a very interesting argument. Uh, but then, again, if we put it in this local, historical, specific context, which we also need to do when we interpret uh, pieces like this, then it gets this, the universalist perspective gets really problematic mm -hmm. because it leaves out um, the impact that pieces like this actually have on the political rhetoric and discourse around war, around violence, um, occupation, resistance, all which are ambiguously packaged here addressed, but then not really taken responsibility for it. That's, I think, um, that's why I felt this kind of friction in her work between nostalgia and non-nostalgia, you know, mm -hmm. like at the same time. Kind of. Yeah. But I'll leave you now. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, maybe other people point. have questions. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Uh, I was hoping you could elaborate a little on and I can't remember exactly how you phrased it, so maybe this will be hard to articulate, but... Hopefully I can remember. <laughs> <laughs> this, I, you said something sort of towards the end of your talk about how, um, about her sort of universal uh, sort of, uh, claim or desire maybe for universalism, that she was enacting it, that in fact then she, in this video, is enacting it in, in, an individual act or sort of rejecting collectivity, do you know exactly what I'm referring I to? Don't know I, was I don't know exactly, but, but maybe I, I can say s uh, something about, about how I think that the universal is, is functioning, maybe in Anna's But I'm, it's not so much, my question it. isn't so much about uh, the universal, it's more that there was the specific part where you said something about how collectivity or collective action is, imp is, is impossible or sort of viewed or pr portrayed as impossible. <laughs> right. Well, uh, I, I'm going to try and retrace, but the thing that I like in Anat Singh's, uh, the book that I'm citing from is Anat Singh's Friction, uh, an ethnography of global connection, a really great book where she goes and does an ethnography of, of uh, deforestation in Indonesia. And she's trying to say, you know, in anthropology, what's happened is that the critiques of new ethnography has valorized a kind of uh, cultural relativism, that means that you do work in a particular locale and you don't generalize. And she said, how can I do an ethnography of deforestation in Indonesia without talking about gold mining, Canadian gold mining speculation and the global environmental movement and nationalism and finance capital and right. And so how do I do an ethnography of the global present? And what she, what she comes up with is this, this, this notion of friction that actually what we take to be these seamless qualities of globalization, that it moves seamlessly, that it flows, that it's circulatory, whatever is actually, uh, is actually instantiated in these very local, very specific relations that have a great deal of material friction um, where the rubber hits the road. And she says, it's not that, I don't mean to say friction is liberatory. Friction is, can be bad, it can be good, it, right? It, it, it just does. That's the way in which this kind of thing works. And so what she says is that, you know, part of the task of critical and I would say creative scholarship is not to uh, dispense with the universal uh, at the, um, in the interests of fleshing out the local specificity of a particular cultural paradigm. But in Spivak's vision of what the double negative one cannot not want, right? You need to uh, raise a speculative universal aspiration as a ground for local political action. But what she says is that the problem is, is that whenever you claim a universal, like freedom of speech or justice, or you erase all of the work of collaboration, solidarity, partnership, uh, the, 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 
the immense amount of organizing that happens on the ground to produce that as a category that makes any sense, right? And to produce freedom of speech as something that matters to uh, hunger strikers in Turkey <laughs> the, as Turkey's trying to enter into the European Union, right? Something like that. And so she says at the same time, the focus on collaboration, the focus on just negotiation and difference elides that moment of trying to say actually through the work of collaboration, through solidarity, one can posit as a speculative universal uh, a, a category that can make some work happen for you. And so what I wasn't saying is that the universal here disables the possibility of collaboration, but that the problem with the global sphere is that when you want to talk generalizable categories, you erase local specificity. When you want to talk local, you erase the generalizable category, right? And the only way in which you can do this is through friction, she says. And friction is actually the ways in which the global comes into being because globalization isn't continuous and hasn't mapped the whole world, but enacts in very specific processes, different parts of the world under its spell in particular logics, right? And so what, she's, what I'm saying, I think, in relationship to this is that how might one posit the universal? I mean, the universal that's being posited by the partisans is a kind of revolutionary, right? Um, the, the people, it's using categories like the people and consciousness and categories that uh, are not available to us in the same way uh, as they might have been, even if they were a fiction in the 1940s, right, are even more of a fiction right now. And so how is it that we can mobilize these categories um, through a kind of tacking back and forth between the friction of the work of collaboration and the aspirational discourse of a generalized category? And, and that's what I say I think her work is doing, is saying we counterpose these kinds of aspirational uh, moments where political consciousness seems possible and, and that grounds the sense that we may work together under the same banner. Uh, and yet, even as we do that, we have to look at the ways in which that kind of work has to happen through very local struggles and encounters on the ground that produce, you know, that produce not occupy everywhere as this kind of rising of the multitude, but produce a lot of work of, um, of collaboration and teaching and model building and, uh, and, and the slips of the terminology so that the work gets mobilized in a different social context. Right. Does that kind of get it? Yeah, it does, thanks. Yeah. Hi, um, as you were discussing this piece and then of course thinking of Jameson who says always historicize, um, it's interesting too to think about this piece, not just how um, there is this creative geography, but how she does treat history. And I'm wondering if um, you could talk a little bit about how she treats this history um, in Jameson's terms. Mm -hmm. Like how does she create this kind of pastiche of history mm -hmm. through the work? Mm -hmm. And how does she use uh, video as a way of, even though she refers back to the 1940s, there's a sense that what occurred at the 1940s would be impossible now. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. It's a very complicated question. Okay. <laughs> I have to think a little bit. I, the thing that I think Jameson does that I find useful is a grounding in the materiality of semiotic messages, right? So that it's not, it's not a simulacrum. You don't want to move for the postmodern in this, this vision of the detachment of signs from the reference. He really wants to say, actually, the referential is there. It's just there in a different kind of way in the seams between different pieces, right? And it's there in the ways in which the technology articulates itself in a particular social and economic conjuncture, right? And so uh, I think one of the things I was saying is that, you know, I mean, she uses Kuleshov. She doesn't use, like, Eisenstein, right? And Kuleshov was more naive in some ways than Eisenstein. He, his montage wasn't dialectical. It was, it was about the building of a kind of narrative crescendo. It was about synthesis, right? It was, it was naive in these very strange ways. Um, and her use of that montage technique rather than another is the, 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 um, 
articulation of a particular liberatory vision in the, lang the aesthetic language of that particular vision, right? And then the interruption of that through the, the strategies that she uses here to, I mean, th this scene to me was, was really the one that, that, that articulated for me that, that impossibility of producing like something that would look like a Kuleshov narrative, right? because she constantly returns back to the same scene and you see it from above and you see it from below and you see, and the excesses of that scene just constantly being repeated to you don't produce synthesis. They produce surplus, they produce excess, they produce render, rending. And this is a particular moment uh, where the steps mobilize a sense of liminality, of a space between, of a space mm -hmm. crossed by, and also of disuse of a space that's no longer a space of revolutionary action, space that's marked really by it's kind of out of the way sort of sort of nature. And so the use of things like the Kalishnikov rifle, the use of the Kuleshov method, the use of the Oscar Davicho poem are all, you know, how can one think that moment in the material historical conditions of its own aesthetic language? And how can we, instead of supplanting that with a sense of the new and saying, right, we, we, um, um, we, uh, have to articulate something in the in 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 the languages of of new media and the way in which people kind of um, um, find hope in the possibilities of new communications technologies. She says, "Well, that would be to just articulate a kind of simulacral contemporary moment that we need to understand the ways in which the juxtapositions of different material historical moments are lived in the present as a resource of." Uh, fields of possibility of, of forms of semiosis and that for her the uh, the referent here is that crisscrossing is that narrative that never goes anywhere <laughs> it comes back right to its beginning with if I had to do the same thing again I would start on the same path and that uh, you know Jameson reads the <laughs> The referent, and he, he's reading um, the video Alienation in his reading of video, and he says the referent is the killing of Harvey Milk that's only shown in Alienation by the carton of milk and then this violence, but it takes so much work to find Harvey Milk and all of that is the historical reference that's never figured in the film, right? Because you can't figure the referent in the film in the same kind of way. And I think she's doing the same thing. I mean, the, the political actions in the contemporary moment are nowhere here. Right, um, and yet they're the driving force for her kind of obsessive movement through space of the cutting apart of the space that she enacts, the synthesizing that doesn't synthesize, a movement that goes nowhere, right? Um, that that seems to me to be the historical specificity of the referent in the terms of a contemporary moment that isn't simulacral. So there's that. Thank you, Krista, um, for that very stimulating presentation. Um, I, I found it uh, quite interesting in relation to some of the other talks that have taken place, um, particularly uh, Ross Gray's uh, that we heard last week, um, in relation to the notion of aspiration. Uh, and um, we've been reading uh, in the seminar uh, Annette Michelson's uh, Cinema and the Radical Aspiration, mm -hmm. which I think, I mean, that's from 1966. Wow. And I think that that, it, it kind of, um, an aspect of that is related to the description that I wrote of cinematic migrations, for example, of something that exists before uh, perhaps the formal material of film, uh, and, and which is a kind of, uh, uh, guiding point or kind of stimulus in terms of these investigations. Uh, and so I was very uh, happy to hear you use the word <laughs> aspiration in relationship to these things because I, it seems to me that a number of different kinds of ways of perceiving of people's motivations to do things in the world are related to that, uh, to that notion. Uh, in many different kinds of ways. And so I was wondering if you could say something. I'm very curious about the book um, and the prismatic 
aspects uh, and the kaleidoscopic aspects. And so rather than to get fixated on um, this part that you presented tonight, I was curious um, about whether y uh, you could say something about some of the other aspects of what your research has entailed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Let me just say, the use of the word aspiration has only come out of reading Anat Singh and thinking about her, um, about her commitment, um, critical commitment, I think, that she has in the text. Prior to this, and, and still the, the kind of guiding force for my thinking, is uh, Spivak's notion of teleopoesis. And that, for me, has been um, the the kind of guiding light, the framework within which my sense of the work one does in the present for a future one can't conceive that we'll look back at this moment as having been, right? That, that beautiful movement of the future anterior um, that Spivak mobilizes and mobilizes through the poetic, right? Through the ways in which poetic language is always excessive to meaning um, and therefore gestures past itself towards something else. That's been, in many ways, the framework within which I've thought about artistic practice and its potential um, as, a, as a language of the political that's very different from the rationalization of political language in the contemporary moment. Um, prismatic uh, media, the notion of the prismatic, came uh, in, in one sense out of that. How does one produce a, uh, a, a visual, I'm mostly interested in visual media and, and mostly in video, but how does one produce uh, a, a visual text that works towards that, that, that notion of the future anterior? And uh, the way I try and think about the prismatic is through um, Donna Harry's notion of diffraction. She uses diffraction uh, and refraction as metaphors. Uh, she says, you know, reflection is clearly that, that kind of mirroring gesture that reproduces the image of the same in other, other locations. But reflexivity, she says, also does that, displaces and replaces with, um, with uh, a, a kind of omnipotence of vision. And um, I think that's, that's allied to the critique that Trin Manha makes in, in her critique of reflexivity, that what it does is it reaffirms the position of the speaking subject as a particularity, but says, right, that the, the, the documentary filmmaker will do a lot of work to locate themselves in the filmic text, but in doing that will reaffirm their particular positionality. And, and I critique, for, and it's an easy target, but I critique Born into Brothels specifically for doing that, right, for in the subjective position of the filmmaker and in her own project of reaffirming a particular um, subject position that, that, um, that, that Trin is, is uh, critical of. And so, for me, the strategies of refraction and diffraction are a way not only of highlighting the materiality of forms of mediation, that media mediates in these very specific kind of ways, um, both semiotic and technological and material, um, but above and beyond that, that they do that in a social context that binds the people watching, the people on screen, and the people producing together and inscribes them in ideology in particular kinds of ways. And also produces modes of subjectivity, modes of looking that are excessive to the text. And so the sense of the ways in which the metaphors of bending, breaking light break that kind of enlightenment <laughs> narrative in visualizing is particularly important to me in, in political projects where the evidentiary and the documentary still reigns as a kind of um, truth narrative or as a kind of um, political 
gravity of that makes artistic practice seem excessive to political acts. And so the prismatic becomes a way of documenting the interference patterns that media does in creating social relationships um, that produces a possibility of the poetic, of the teleopoetic, of the poetic f in the service of a kind of different form of subject position, subjectivization, and sociality, uh, ultimately. And so I look at, um, I look at different case studies. Uh, the, the first is actually the, the ethnic cleansing campaigns in the former Yugoslavia, and the ways in which um, um, the kind of mythical language of nation and its tying to the female body produced a kind of singularity, mythical singularity of meaning that needed to be broken apart through diffraction. Um, a diffraction that didn't either reclaim the female body as a rape victim in the kind of global solidarity of violence against women, nor reclaim the women's body in an ethnic narrative of the mother of the nation, right? So how to do this kind of work of deflecting both of those sides of critique. Um, in, uh, in the second chapter to look at to the representations of uh, sexual, uh, of uh, sex workers in red light districts in India, and particularly the ways in which the representations of sex work has to deal with the thorny issue of the eroticization of, uh, through images of the sex worker herself, and how it might deal with this, the worker's own desire in a way that really gets sublimated by a lot of documentary treatments of sex work and of sex workers. Mm -hmm. Um, in the third chapter, I look at um, uh, the boundary uh, disputes in Israel and Palestine and the kind of crossing of the body over uh, through checkpoints and over boundaries and what it means to cross nations in this particular way and how prismatic vision might allow you to see from, from two different perspectives at the same time or see across these differential spaces. Uh, and then finally, I look at... Uh, the binary of visibility and invisibility in the in the uh, latest war in Afghanistan, and particularly the ways in which women's rights were mobilized as a rights of bringing into visibility, and how the kind of um, the scylla of visibility and the charybdis of invisibility was really located a women's um, uh, feminist activism in an impossible space. Uh, I wanted to neither be visible nor be invisible. Right. So what does that mean for producing a kind of poetic text that gestures towards the impossibility of representation in the terms that have been outlined by the kind of language of iconoclasm and on the other hand, the language of visibility mobilized by the Bush administration, right? So prismatic vision was not, on the one hand, it was a kind of, you know, there were some formal devices of using multi-channel video, of using looping and found footage, contrasting found footage, there were specific devices that were being used in these cases, but the predicament against which they were working is a predicament in culture and ideology, in which to take up one side is to reaffirm the binary. So how can, through diffraction, through refraction, how can you break apart the terms of how one comes into visibility, the terms of political discourse? And for me, the, the, the poetic and the teleopoetic is that aspirational, that excessive, Right, is this, this way of doing that work in a way that I find really interesting. And I, I don't have a background in art history, and so I really came to thinking about artistic practice because of that, because I, uh, I, I was faced with the, the limitations of, a, of realism and of a kind of documentary tradition in the presencing of the political that made me want to look at other modes of, I mean, I look at experimental documentaries as well, and, um, but, but to look at the mode of the aesthetic and the poetic as a mode of political praxis that really does something that's very different um, from political discourse itself. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I, I found myself thinking about the um, kind of history of walking in modernity or, you know, the idea of the sort of um, the romantics relationship to walking or the Christ-like march of death in World War I or the flaneur and the protester. And I was just wondering if you had, if you, you know, or to hear your thoughts about the characterization of the 
way in which she's moving mm. in the image and you know I also she seemed also like a busy tired worker or I just I just wondered um, yeah if you could share thoughts about the nature of the way she's moving yeah that's very interesting I I have to confess I hadn't even done that work of association with the other other kinds of walking pieces of long or um, or even crawls or you know <laughs> these other kinds of, of very political passages through space um, um, Orozco uh, and others and th those those all come to mind now when you're saying when you're saying that about this this use of the performative of the walking body through space that activates space in a particular way. What strikes me in this piece, I mean, first of all, I think that there isn't, there isn't um, the, the romanticism, I think, that, that one would find in a kind of the, the, the nature walking of the, the earth artists, maybe, that, that you wouldn't see something like that. But in the more politically engaged sort of social spaces, the, the the kind of Michel de Certeau tactics of <laughs> moving through the city in particular ways, there there could be something there. What I what I find remarkable about this is how little her walking does anything to the space in the performance itself. I mean, it's only in the video work that the cutting up of this space and this creation of a circuit through the city produces anything like a walk. What we see it, what we see of the performance, no one no she's carrying a rifle and no one blinks. There's just no interaction with people in the street. And you'd have to think of these interventions as her moving across the space with a camera and then moving back across the space. It certainly isn't it doesn't have the 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 duration of a walk in the way in which even the crawls or even the um, do. It has this very cut up kind of, she walks through this one location and walks through it again and then moves to another location of the city and then walks through it and walks through it again. That, that the only continuity we have of the walk is actually videographic. It's not, um, it's not in the world itself. And so I think experientially, although she calls it, uh, she calls it a, what is it, a performance, a public, public action, I think she calls it a public action. It strikes me that, uh, this video work is, n is not a documentation of a performance, right? It really enacts the walk in a way that in the city she doesn't, she doesn't enact because there's no continuity of, continuity of movement in the real world. And that that might be important to her vision of political action or revolutionary struggle is that it only ever occurs mediated by these devices that, stri that stitch together these fragments and that you don't have that sense of yes, you can do an action in the world that moves through a space and activates it in the same kind of way, or, um, or certainly not at the scale of the political action that you'd like to have. At the scale of the local, you might be able to do it, right? But at the scale of the global, you can't do it. So how do you envision and imagine the walk in relationship to that? You don't actually walk much, <laughs> right? Um, so I think the kind of ritualistic, durational aspects of earlier performance pieces and isn't enacted here, even though something of the language is there in the final video, final video work. But I, I'm, I, I'm tempted to think more about that now that you've asked that question. Thank you. Um. Thank you all very much. It was a real pleasure.